Shoop was open about her mental health struggles at the time. In her emails to Curry, she mentioned needing help with her testimony because she was on a high dose of Valium. When Brooks asked her to work with a ghostwriter, she accepted citing, quote, serious mental health issues that, quote, caused my writing to be a gift that comes and goes. So like literally exhausting her use as a tool to the point where she can't even physically operate anymore. Literal demons. Like, and it's interesting too, because literally they say the opposite is the case. Turfs literally say the opposite is the case. They say, oh, if our policies get put in place, the trans people or people who think they're trans, their mental health will get better. And here's one of their own who they coerced and manipulated into becoming a tool for them, having the literal exact understandable and predictable reaction to what their policies would actually do to everybody else. So if you didn't see, if you don't know, there was a recent leak from the same holy f***ing Bengal person with the Sprigatito plushie who leaked, um, what was it? What was the previous leak? Oh, it was, yeah, it was the people on a no-fly list. Then the other one, she ended up just being not the hacker, but the person publishing the information that ended up getting picked up by Mother Jones, if I recall correctly, about these 2,600 pages of leaked emails of Catholic and Christian conservatives in their coordinated campaign in order to turn anti-trans issues into, for one, like one of the main pillars of Republican policy platforms, you know, hating trans people because they don't understand what trans people are, what, what it means. They're scared of it, so they want to ban it because that's their instinctual reaction instead of opening their minds and using their logic and reason and looking at the data and studies and coming to conclusions based off of that, they go off their first instinct, like the scared little bitches they are, and decide to just ban it outright. So that 2,600 pages of leaked emails was put out, and now included in that is this story of Eliza Ray Shoop, who's a detransitioner, so somebody who transitioned to a gender that they were not assigned at birth and then ended up going back after realizing that they were actually cis to the gender they were assigned at birth, right? So it's a long article. It's a Bible. And frankly, I'm not trying to read much at all, much less a Bible. So I'm going to link it in the description. We're going to try to get the key elements of it because goddamn, this is Homer Ziliad. On Wednesday, March 8th, Mother Jones broke the news of a secret working group that had collaborated to craft anti-trans legislation targeting youth health care and spread it to multiple states. The existence of that group, which included numerous elected officials, members of Christian conservative policy groups, such as the Family Policy Alliance and the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, you know, the very Orwellian name here, literally trying to work to undo the freedoms that people have in this country, not even just on trans issues. And representatives from anti-trans quote-unquote feminist group Women's Liberation Front, Wolf, which is an interesting name considering, you know, Wolf in the hen house, you know, ooh, I just want to protect women, let me into your group, hens, I just want to protect women, but I'm actually going to work with people like Matt Walsh and neo-Nazis who want to strip trans people of their rights, but those people also want to strip all women, not even just trans women, all women, cis women from their rights as well, Wolf, right? Among others, proved that the current onslaught of anti-trans legislation was the result of a coordinated campaign. Imagine my shock. Considering it's not a very popular issue in the mainstream of human thought in America, uh, it turns out it does not poll very high and does not galvanize people to go out and vote for Republicans. That's one of the reasons why people speculate that the red wave we were supposed to get became a red piss puddle on the ground for the Republicans in the most recent midterms. It's because they over-focused on culture war, quote-unquote, issues like the, you know, the eradication of transgenderism, see also trans people from the United States of America, if not the entire world, uh, instead of focusing on shit that people actually give a fuck about like uh, being able to pay their bills and not going into medical debt because they got sick. Anyway, <clears throat> within hours of the Mother Jones story publishing, a 2,600-page PDF archive of the leaks was posted online. So here we have said original article with this very cute cat that follows your cursor around, that if I don't get myself off of this page, I will not be able to stop looking at it. So we'll link to that as well. That archive is substantial and it is damning, but the public leaks are not the whole story. When the archive was posted, I had already been reading through the leaked emails for several days. The leaker, a trans woman and former detransition activist named Eliza Ray Shoop, had reached out to me to offer access and I had come away with a whole other story. 
The full archive sent to me and other journalists contains every email Shoop sent or received from both of her two email accounts between 2017 and 2023, the years when she was most active as a member of the organized anti-trans movement. There are years of media, legislative, and tactical strategy outlined in those emails. There are conversations in which some of the most well-known TERFs in the movement coordinate strategy and brainstorm talking points. It is a playbook for how anti-trans organizations operate and a compressed history of how the TERF movement joined forces with the Christian right to create the current moment. Which is funny, because the F in TERF is supposed to stand for a feminist and not fucking idiot. Uh, and apparently feminists, I've been told, are in favor of getting equality for women, and frankly all genders, uh, because they happen to be a gender, I'm being told. And the Christian right doesn't want that, actually. The Christian right wants to use religious justifications in order to relegate women and girls to the property of their husbands and fathers. They want to make them essentially property. Great job, TERFs. You're really feminisming very well. Who knew that all it took to unite far-right Christian nationalists, Nazis, and supposed feminists, all it took to unite these unlikely bedfellows was uh, the hatred and visceral disgust of people who are not like them. No way. Most important, it is a record of how Eliza Ray Shoup was crafted into a weapon, how her narrative was established, edited, and eventually taken out of her control, even as her name appeared on testimonies, Supreme Court briefings, and highly circulated op-eds. This is the making of a detransitioner, quote-unquote. More like her are being made every day. And they are. There are detransitioners out there. There are people that transitioned, realized it wasn't the best play for them, and then work with the same medical professionals that help them with their transition would help for the detransition because you need endocrinologists, you need experts, you know. There are detransitioners out there. They are valid and deserve all of your sympathy. However, there are also what I would call political detransitioners. Those detransitioners who weaponize their status or identity as detransitioners in order to restrict healthcare from all trans people because they had a bad go of it, which is unfortunate, but I think that's a bit of an overblown reaction to it. Eliza Ray Shoup transitioned in 2013. It did not go well. Her hormone levels were improperly monitored and she wound up with blood clots and painful skin reactions to her estrogen patches. So ideally, in a proper system that is fully fleshed out, is very robust, and is not restricted but rather expanded, that would be less likely to happen. I don't know the specifics about her transition care. If she transitioned in 2013, though, trans healthcare back then was certainly more inadequate than it is today. So the ideal would be that in an expanded system, in a robust and comprehensive system, that would be less likely to happen because there would be better standards of care. There would be more doctors on call, on hand to be able to go to. For a lot of people, depending on where you live, there aren't very many doctors that are actually educated on trans healthcare to begin with. So you end up going down paths that may or may not be the best and most fleshed out, like I say. So if you're concerned about things like this happening, an expansion of healthcare is what you need, not not a restriction of it. The restriction makes it worse. Still, in her early transition, she presented a positive face her background. She was a retired military veteran, a decorated sergeant first class, who received transition care from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Made her an interesting story. She was famously the first person in the United States to be legally designated non biny Look at that. Wow. non biny you say? I happen to be one of those people. In a 2015 article for the New York Times, Shoup wrote that, quote, radical conservative politicians and religious groups routinely attack her very existence with legislation to deny me basic human rights, such as a bathroom that matches my gender identity. We are not far off from that 2015 article. In fact, we are worse off in many ways than we used to be. Not good. By 2017, Shoup was working with the LGBTQ2S plus civil rights organization Lambda Legal. She had been profiled by queer-friendly publications as recently as 2016. Uh, it's an interesting date if you consider the rightward shift of this country vis-a-vis -vis the election of Donald Trump. But it was becoming increasingly clear that something had shifted. In January 2017, email interview with New York Magazine writer Alexis Sulis Ray, which was intended for Sulis Ray's book Finding Normal, Shoup wrote, quote, I never thought of myself as a female. I was led to believe that. And claimed that medical transition can't alleviate gender dysphoria. Hmm, interesting. Quote, gender dysphoria is a donkey chasing a carrot in a program that the Twisted Shrinks created that's fueled with societal norms and sex stereotypes. Jesus. God damn. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, the, the way you would word this certainly doesn't look like you're not reaching for any kind of emotional response in people. No, we're just trying to stick to the facts. We're trying to look at the data. We were trying to be logical and learn about basic biology here, you know?
no emotionally charged rhetoric at all going on here. She told Sulis Rhea that she, quote, totally agrees with a lot of the hardcore feminist ideologies about biological sex and gender. Re turfs, which aren't actually feminists, and actively work against the ideals of feminists and also the liberation of women. Cis women, even. And lamented the fact that trans rights activists have depicted TERFs as, quote, mortal enemies. It's almost like that's by design on your part in the TERF side of things, right? Like, if your whole point of being a trans-exclusionary, radical feminist, is being trans-exclusionary, then yeah, you've kind of made yourself a mortal enemy of trans people because you're trying to make trans people no longer be able to exist as the people they deserve to be. Sulis Rie may not have recognized these talking points, but someone else soon did. By May 2017, Shoup had been offered a role as a guest blogger at Gender Identity Watch, run by the notorious trans-exclusionary feminist Kathy Brennan. She was also published on the blog Youth Trans Critical Professionals, run by Lisa Marciano, who also sometimes operated under the pseudonym Lisa Bell. Marciano was also working closely with an activist known variously as Denise Marie and Jeanette, though Marciano referred to her simply by the name of her website, Fourth Wave Now. This was the deep end of the turf pool in the United States. Brennan's loud, corrosive online presence, as per Jezebel, quote, did more to push a noxious brand of anti-trans feminism on the internet than any other person in the country. Round of applause. <laughs> Doing as much as you need to to make feminists look bad. Great job. Over 8,900 people signed a petition asking the Southern Poverty Law Center to classify Gender Identity Watch as a hate group due partly to Brennan's habit of using the blog to out and shame specific trans people. Hmm, seems to be a common tactic amongst not only TERFs, but also the Nazis that happen to show up at their rallies. Interesting stuff. Marciano and Fourth Wave Now, along with a physician and researcher named Lisa Littman, were instrumental in creating, quote, rapid onset gender dysphoria, the debunked yet widely cited theory that youth transition is caused by social contagion. Literally a conspiracy theory. These early communications provide a first-hand look at how TERFs push talking points into the mainstream. Lambda Legal had been growing increasingly uncomfortable with Shu's politics, and when her anti-trans writings came to light, they dropped her entirely. Shu wrote to Brennan, asking for sympathetic, quote, media contacts, and Brennan wrote back with a list. The first name on it was Michelle Goldberg, who lamented the plight of TERFs in a 2014 article for The New Yorker, and has since been criticized for transphobia in her column at The New York Times. Goldberg denies any close relationship with Brennan, telling me via email that she, quote, thinks she spoke to her in 2014 for a piece she was researching for The New Yorker, but didn't end up quoting her, and that she doesn't remember their conversation. When self-described, quote, gender culture of war reporter Lisa Celine Davis wrote another Times editorial widely criticized as transphobic, Marciano reached out to arrange a phone call between Davis and Shoup, noting hopefully that, quote, Lisa had been met with Chase Strangio and Kate Bornstein looking for common ground, but is looking for other trans perspectives as well. Shoup says she and Davis stayed in touch after the phone call and was able to show me an email exchange dated December 2022. Not all these attempts paid off. In February 2019, Shoup contacted Abigail Schreier, disgraced author of the book Irreversible damage, though I don't know if she was ever graced, which argues that the, quote, transgender craze is, quote, seducing our daughters and causing vulnerable cis girls to transition due to social contagion, based off of a conspiracy theory and also just dog shit writing and contradicts itself. There's a really good video I watched on it that from a YouTuber that I'm actually kind of new to the content of. I'm going to try to find her. Let me sec. Ah, Cass Aris. Yes. Cass Aris. Very good YouTube channel. Also, smaller than me. Slept on. The end of irreversible damage updates and stories. Cognitive psychiatrist response to irreversible damage. This is the video I watched. Um, there's also the older one as well. If you want to learn more about the book itself without having to read the pile of garbage of a book that it is. Though Schreier proposed a phone call, not much seems to have come of that conversation. Shoop made a slightly more successful pitch to podcaster Katie Herzog, who reached out to Shoop multiple times via Twitter DM asking for interviews, but did not end up using any of Shoop's quotes. In both cases, Shoop says the roadblock was the same. Schreier and Herzog were, quote, invested in selling D-trans women, not males. Hmm. Interesting. Quote, people like me are inferior sales tools, Shoop tells me in an email. With narratives like the one that Laura Ingram peddled, that I'm mentally ill and instead of giving me therapy, the VA gave me hormones, etc., it's not as good of a seller as a damaged young woman. You know, the white woman tears are a powerful motivator, especially if you can weaponize the white woman tears that are not justifiable. See also worrying that your womanhood is under threat because other kinds of women exist and that they always have. Herzog disputes Shoop's characterization as to why she didn't include Shoop's comments in her stories, stating an email to extra that she didn't include Shoop over concerns of her mental health. Finding anti-trans narratives that would, quote, sell to the general public was a constant concern for this crowd, and Shoop says it didn't much matter if the narratives were based in fact or not. 
What? No way. Are you telling me that the side of the fence, the side of the argument that doesn't have any actual studies or data to back up their points don't really care too much about the facts of the matter? This seems to be a recurring theme. Margiano, for instance, eagerly watched the spread of the RGD theory, quote, trans feminist writer and researcher Julia Serrano has already written a takedown she exulted in one August 2018 email. Shoop suspects Marciano's role is larger than the public knows, quote, Marciano never explicitly said she is the inventor of ROGD, but the evidence points to her and she's listed as a contributor to the Liza Lippmann study on PLOS 1, she writes to me. Quote, my opinion is that Marciano and the fourth wave now folks are behind the ROGD study and Lippmann merely fronted it for them to make it appear unbiased. The founder of fourth wave now in an email to Extra denies Shoop's allegations, calling them completely untrue. This is also not outside of the realm of possibility because that's also what happened with the now disgraced whistleblower Jamie read from that Missouri gender clinic where Barry Weiss was the one who was the kind of unbiased reporter helping her tell her story but it seems like it was not as unbiased as we were led to believe and actually complete bullshit as it was contradicted by dozens of the parents of the patients at said gender clinic. Examining the archive, it seems that Marciano had a hand in advancing multiple similarly bogus theories. On two separate occasions, for instance, she asked Sharp for help in arguing that transition causes teen suicide. The exact opposite is the fact, actually. But, you know, whatever you need to do to twist the misery of the same people that you are working to exacerbate the misery of into your own political gain, I guess. If you believe in hell, then I hope you'll be able to, you know, stand the heat, I guess. Quote, comparing notes, we are noticing that only suicides of trans scenes that we hear about are among those kids who are being supported and affirmed and are transitioning or transitioned, Leela Alcorn being the only exception. Marciano wrote in the first email, dated October 15, 2018, quote, since there are no national statistics that would allow us to test the hypothesis that transition may increase suicidality, we want to try to mine news reports to see what they show. Are you able to put your hands on as many reports of trans teen suicide stories as possible? Just look, just itching, chomping at the bit. I want to know more about these kids committing suicide because that is useful for my political ends like what the fuck is wrong with you man it's one thing to try to get get to the data on hand it's another to want to weaponize it for political gain literally pushing for policy that would exacerbate that same problem you know much the same way that republicans always talk about how much they love veterans even though they oppose measures that would stop veterans from literally being homeless conservatives love veterans so much they want to create more of them and then once they come back from whence they were sent who gives a fuck same way, you know, when it comes to trans people and their suicides. They want this big problem of trans people committing suicide to be a product of that transition, so they're willing to try to create the evidence of that. You know what I mean? So, like, that's not actually the case, but they're trying to twist the narrative that it is, and they will actually put in place policies that studies have shown would exacerbate teen suicide, and then they would use that evidence, quote-unquote, to buttress their original fake narratives. It's the same way that Donald Trump was like, oh my God, there's so much corruption in the election. There's so much corruption in the election. And then he talked about maybe his people should go out and do voter fraud because they're trying to create the evidence of voter fraud to be able to weaponize it. You know what I mean? Though that one is not as, you know, solid. Marciano was still looking for those stories in October 2019 when she again wrote to Shoop that quote, I would like to write something about how the trans narrative is actually making kids feel suicidal, even though it's the opposite, how the suicidality is because of transition, even though it's the opposite, or perhaps being told that if they are trans, they will feel suicidal, which is not true. Wow. That she struggled to find data is no surprise. Multiple studies show that transition significantly reduces suicidality among trans and non-binary youth, with different studies giving rate reductions ranging from 40% to a staggering 73% reduction. It's also not common for psychologists or researchers to start with a firm conclusion and work backward to cherry-pick the evidence, which, as Marciano herself wrote, would have been impossible to collect, but that's what Republicans and conservatives have always needed to do. They have a worldview that they want to exist. They feel uncomfortable that that reality that they wish existed actually isn't the one we all actually live in and then they work backward from their conclusion to try to build that reality so that they can feel more comfortable with themselves still it was all part of the game which was less about truth and more about finding the right emotional buttons to push in order to provoke an anti-trans backlash quote she just kept working at different things until they found something that worked shoop tells me in a phone call it was just like endlessly trying something does this thing work does this get traction if not you know move on to this this is also similar to what we see in the more mainstream anti-trans panic first it started with bathroom bills way back when then it moved on to leah thomas more recently and uh what are uh, trans women in women's sports we're just worried about the sanctity of women's sports 
Then it turned out to, oh my god, literally every single LGBTQ person and their allies are groomers and threats to children and should be, you know, potentially met with capital punishment for this. It's always been an entry point. They always try to find something that works, throw shit at the wall, whatever sticks is what they end up going with. Shoop was a valuable player in this game because as a quote detransitioner, she could lend credence to other people's theories by claiming that they accurately described her. One major theory was quote autogynophilia, which is also a conspiracy theory at this point. It's completely debunked. A term coined by gender critical sexologist Ray Blanchard, piece of shit, to argue that at least some trans women are fetishistic men who gain sexual satisfaction from seeing themselves as female. In our phone call, Shoop refers to, quote, working with Blanchard to get the autogonophilia diagnosis. I asked her what she means, assuming that she got the idea from his work. No, Shoop said. He told me how to get diagnosed. So that theory has been debunked for a while now. Uh, turns out, if you ask cis women the same questions you ask trans women to diagnose them with autogynephilia, those cis women end up having autogynephilia as well. Funny that. People like to be looking good and feel sexy because they're human. It's crazy, I know. By January 2019, Shoop had publicly renounced her non-binary identity and publicly identified as male, and by the end of the year, she had legally changed her name from Jamie, the chosen name for her first transition to James. In a February 2019 email, Shoop wrote to Blanchard that she wanted a diagnosis of autogynephilia and asked how to get one. Shoop was not a patient of Blanchard, just a fellow traveler in anti-trans circles, but Blanchard responded in detail, quote, Your psychiatrist could consider two diagnoses, he wrote. The first is transvestic disorder, and either or both of its two specifiers, quote, with autogynephilia and, quote, in full remission. He warned her that other diagnosis, quote, gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults was less desirable, and encouraged her to share his letter with healthcare providers, quote, I have no opposition to your sharing the contents of this email with any psychiatrist you might consult in the future or anywhere else you might see fit. Imagine my shock that this piece of shit, garbage, dog shit, so-called psychiatrist or whatever, uh, is also trying to work backward from his conclusion and trying to literally invent diagnoses to prove his initial bullshit claims. Shoop maintained a friendly correspondence with Blanchard, as she did with many other members of the burgeoning U.S.-based turf movement. It was in March 2019 when she met one of the movement's most controversial leaders, Kara Dansky, board chair of Wolf, and the woman widely credited with bringing turfs into the right wing. Dansky's willingness to openly align with right-wing groups such as the ADF made her a polarizing figure in turf circles. Brennan openly loathed her, but it also given her access to forms of political power that eluded her peers. The loose, informal network of turfs was no match for the organized firepower and well-funded think tanks of the Christian right, and Dansky seemed to know it. Quote, my instinct is that it will be detransitioners, parents, and athletes who will break this open, not radical feminists. Dansky wrote to Shoop in that March 2019 introduction, and I am okay with that. And it was literally true, by the way. The major one was not detransitioners, was partially parents, was the athletes. Leah Thomas. You remember? It was an entry point. The ultimate goal? Eradicating transgenderism, i.e. eradicating transgender people. Shoop was open to working with conservatives and had been cultivating her own contacts at the ADF since at least 2017 when she spoke with senior counsel Gary McCaleb about changing the gender markers on her documentation. Still, beginning in 2019, those ties became much more important. This was due in part to another subject discussed in the Dansky emails in an email dated March 13, 2019. Shoop complained that the Social Security Administration required her to file a gender change when she detransitioned. You want to sue them, Dansky wrote. I wonder if this might be something ADF would take on if you're willing to work with them. So, if you are a detransitioner and you are wanting to parlay your trauma, a valid trauma if you are legitimately a detransitioner, somebody who has detransitioned uh, or, you know, no longer trans, and you want to parlay that trauma and weaponize it to stop all trans people, the majority of whom are not detransitioners, from being able to access that care, you got an entire fucking organization with infrastructure lawyers' money to back you up and potentially cut you checks. Lawsuits were a key part of the anti-trans strategy from the start, and part of this is because of the Federalist Society, by the way, if you've watched my channel for any amount of time, you'll know that the Federalist Society is essentially a far-right organization that is trying to get activist conservative judges, activist far-right judges, on courts of every level in the United States of America, uh, especially the Supreme Court. The reason being, you can put laws in place, but if you have a challenge, it'll go to the courts, and then the judge there will decide, you know, if the law could stay in place or not. And eventually, if that gets challenged far enough, it goes out to the Supreme Court. You know, the grand wizards on the Supreme Court who are unelected and who are often appointed by people who don't even win the popular vote in the general election, they get to decide, as their royal decree, the fate of all the people who the laws affect. Because they understand they cannot win popular elections, they have to go through anti-democratic means in order to get their will forced onto everybody else.
Court proceedings had been instrumental in rolling back trans rights in the UK, for example, in the much publicized Bell v. Tavistock case, where political detransitioner Kyra Bell sued the Tavistock Clinic for prescribing puberty blockers to her as a minor. Shub had been floating the idea of suing someone for the case since at least 2017, with vocal encouragement from her turf colleagues, quote, I know people who would testify, I believe that Ken Zucker would. Mike Bailey, perhaps also, and if they can't, they will know people who can. Marciana wrote in November 2017, adding, quote, I am going to have a lot of resources for you on this, really. You let me know when you are ready, and I will start introducing you to people. Imagine spending so much of your time, life, and money, the limited amount of time you have on this God's green earth, coordinating this vast campaign with other degenerates in order to fucking restrict rights from people who are not affecting you in one way whatsoever. The only way that trans people affect you is that you look at them and because you are bigoted, you feel some kind of disgust. That's a you problem. Clean your own house. Fix your own shit. Clean your room, bucko. That's not my problem. That's not any trans person's problem. That's your problem. Stop being such a snowflake. Stop getting triggered about people existing, living their lives, working jobs they hate just like everybody else. Fuck off. Shoop's lawsuit, as it eventually took shape, resembled the Bell case in some respects. She alleged that the Department of Veterans Affairs had been hasty in providing her with gender-affirming care and claimed that her mental health issues, which included PTSD and borderline personality disorder BPD, should have disqualified her for treatment. By the way, usually what is actually happening when it comes to people trying to seek gender-affirming care, they take forever to actually be able to get it. You actually go through so many hoops and hurdles of gatekeeping in order to get it, even as a fully autonomous adult. The opposite is actually the truth in the majority of cases. The difference was that in 2013, when she began her transition, Eliza Shoup was nearly 50 years old. You're an adult. You've lived on God's green earth for half a century. This would have been a detransitioner suing a branch of the US government on the grounds that it was unethical to provide gender affirming healthcare to adults. That's a harder play because the what about the children argument doesn't really work there. The only way the what about the children argument works when it comes to trans adults is the way that, say, Jordan Peterson would use Elliot Page simply living his life, talking about how he's happy living, being a trans man, and then that apparently somehow influencing children, uh, source crackpipe.jpg. In this respect, the case would have clarified and advanced the goals of the broader anti-trans movement, not only to prohibit youth transition, but to forbid transition at any age, which has always been the goal. It's not that, oh, well, you know, the case against trans adults would be harder, and we don't actually believe in that, so we're not going to go for that. We're looking for eliminating access to youth transition. It's always been that they wanted to eliminate it for adults as well. It's just that the what about the children is a better argument for them. And eventually they would get led to that, using the what about the children wins and gains that they made as precedent for it. Shoop's closest ally in the quest was her attorney, Bob Sullivan, a shoemaker in Sullivan. In a March 12, 2019 email, Sullivan introduced himself to Shoop as a, quote, faithful Catholic who tries to use his legal skill to build the kingdom of God, i.e. force his delusions on everybody else, and promised that he would be more, quote, thorough and aggressive than an attorney who did not understand, quote, the evil of gender ideology. Quote, your case is going to need some medical expert testimony. I may have access to some experts who a non-Catholic and non-Christian may not know, Sullivan wrote, reminding Shoup that, quote, the average psychologist, psychiatrist, or medical doctor is not going to want to lift a finger to help you because the average psychologist, psychiatrist, or medical doctor is not fucking delusional and politically motivated and trying to warp reality into what they want it to be using bunk diagnoses and fake information that has been debunked. Even if physicians or psychiatrists would not find merit in Shoup's claims, the ADF surely did. In a March 22, 2019 email, Gary McCaleb wrote to both Sullivan and Shoup saying that he, quote, called Bob Sullivan. He responded to me most graciously by email earlier this week. I'll do all I can to help him with this. In the ensuing correspondence, McCaleb assisted the medical records and documentation and was made privy to Sullivan's legal strategy for the case, making him a kind of silent partner. Quote, the way it seems to work is ADF will evaluate a lawsuit and fund it if they like it, but it's often similar to the Bob Sullivan situation. Shoup tells me in an email, quote, they don't have the bandwidth to be licensed in every state, so they have a network of lawyers in each that will do their filings. Then ADF pulls the strings from afar and shows up as the bing guns at certain moments. Shoup had been active in the anti-trans movement for years, but her lawsuit, which Sullivan called, quote, a formal step to take down the gender rights movement, stood to make her a key asset. Shoup entered the big leagues. She had also lost control of her own life story. Turns out when you become a tool, when you become a weapon wielded by somebody else, your actual autonomy no longer matters. At the beginning of her gender-critical career, Shoup's public voice was more or less her own. That is, she actually gave the interviews and wrote the blog post that appeared under her name. As Shoup entered the world of the Christian right, however, her voice was increasingly retooled or outright manufactured by her handlers. Hmm. Seems like some of these handlers were probably men trying to speak for women in this instance, huh? Huh. 
but I thought TERFs wanted the opposite to be the case. Sullivan quickly took over Shoop's public image, instructing her to refer all requests for interviews or public appearances to him. In an email chain dated April 2019, he told her not to talk to a Washington Post reporter he deemed trans-friendly and directed her to what he called, quote, good Catholic media sources. In another April 2019 email, Sullivan provided Shoop with what he called an, quote, outline for an op-ed, along with instructions for pitching, quote, you should shop it to the main liberal papers offering it to each one for 24 hours before offering it to a new one. After about four or five, you could then offer it to some more quote, conservative papers until you get one to bite. The quote outline provided by Sullivan was a full essay of 1,609 words. One sentence was typed in red, indicating that Shoop should fill in the details herself. I feel like we're just going to end up reading all of this, huh? <laughs> I've tried to be like, okay, this is probably not as relevant, but it's all good. Shoop's other allies were also eager to use her name. On April 10, 2019, Roger Brooks of the ADF wrote to request help with Schwartz v. City of New York, an ADF-backed lawsuit aimed at overturning New York City's ban on conversion therapy. If you didn't know, conversion therapy has been proven to be literally just torture. Literally just torture. Can I repeat for you? The so-called Catholic Alliance Defending Freedom backed lawsuit wants to overturn a ban on literal torture. Because that's what Jesus Christ would have done. What Brooks needed, he said, was a 700-word op-ed conveying two points. Quote, one, you were horribly lied to and cheated when medical and mental health professionals failed to give you counseling to help you achieve comfort with your natural sex and instead encouraged and supported, quote-unquote, your transition. And two, you and others who chose to detransition need wise mental health counseling as you go through that process. And a law like New York City's that censors your conversations with the professionals you choose to ask for help is an outrage and a cruelty. So literally instructing people to lie about their actual experience with the whole process, and trying to weaponize said lies in order to restrict access to not only gender-affirming care, but re-enable access for people who seek to do torture under the name of conversion therapy. Like I say, I've seen the devil hide behind the mask of Christianity and Catholicism many times before. This is not a new phenomenon. Again, Brooks wanted Shoop's name on the op-ed, but he did not want her to write it. Quote, ADF has some excellent writers familiar with the length and style that appeals to op-ed page editors who could take even a very rough sketch or outline of thoughts from you or just talk with you and then create a draft that I think you will be very happy with because, you know, you cannot think for yourself, apparently. It wasn't just essays. The manufacturer of Shoop's voice sometimes included court testimony. The Family Policy Alliance called on Shoop to testify on behalf of a main bill, HB 755, which prohibited the advertising, offering, and administering of therapy to minors for both sexual orientation and gender identity. Shoop sent the testimony via email to public policy manager Stephanie Curry, who sent it back with edits. So interestingly, I don't know that Shoop lives in Maryland. I don't know that it matters that she lives in Maryland, because somehow the detransitioners that are politically motivated and want to restrict trans healthcare from all people, uh, the majority of which who are not going to be detransitioners, happen to be able to find their way into a variety of places that they don't actually live or have any experience being in. Like, I don't know, Chloe Cole, who is like the one detransitioner that media outlets can seem to find to argue against trans healthcare. I, I will reiterate, the majority of detransitioners out there, there are few in the grand scheme of things. They are a fraction of an already small minority of people, i.e. trans people. The majority of the detransitioners out there are not activist, anti-trans people. They are usually just going to be people who thought they were trans, realized that they weren't, and then have to go through the steps to be the people they want to be. That's it. And they deserve all your love, sympathy, support, and access to medical health care. Detransitioners literally want to do the opposite. They want to restrict health care from everybody. And it would negatively impact detransitioners as well, especially those that end up retransitioning later on, as a lot of them often end up doing, because once again, the majority of people who detransition do so because of negative social stigma, lack of access to health care because it's being outlawed, or lack of funds to continue to finance their transition. Once they regain that access, they end up retransitioning. Not always, but often. Shoop sent the testimony by email to public policy manager Stephanie Curry, who sent it back with edits. At the time, however, Shoop welcomed this, quote, assistance. In fact, she needed it because her own ability to write was compromised. While her career as a detransitioner took off, Eliza Ray Shoop fell apart. In her career as a, quote, detransitioner, there was one thing Eliza Ray Shoop had not yet done. Detransition. It's like the, um, that one person who was like, oh my god, this is what happens when you give a cis female testosterone who claimed that the testosterone caused them to bald, uh, which, surprise, surprise, testosterone causes what is called male pattern baldness. That's why women, cis females, don't suffer from that as much. 
right? However, in this instance, this person who we're being told is uh, female is their biological sex. I'm not exactly sure how they identify nowadays. Apparently a trans man, but detransition, it's a whole mess. Apparently, they were already balding before they went on testosterone and still continue to take testosterone, at least to the last time that I saw mention of it. I don't know about the modern day, like literally today. She went by James, she used he, him pronouns, yet she kept taking estrogen, even as she publicly decried its use. Her lawsuit changed that. The VA stopped providing healthcare, abruptly cutting off her HRT access. Other gender-affirming providers would not take her on as a client, fearing reasonably enough that she might sue. The loss of her HRT, combined with the pressure of her increasingly high profile, caused Shoup's mental health to deteriorate rapidly and severely. Turns out, the ADF, the TERF movement broadly, does not have your best interests in mind. They will use you like the tool they turn you into and then throw you away when you are no longer useful. Her breaking point came after a highly trafficked op-ed at the Daily Signal in which she called herself a mentally ill autogynophile, holy shit, and repeated that, quote, I should have been stopped from transitioning, but out of control transgender activism had made the nurse practitioner too scared to say no. Jesus Christ. Like, it, the level of self-hatred. Jesus. And like the manipulation involved, the coercion and creating that self-hatred as well. Being put into conversion therapy, she wrote, quote, would have protected me from my inclination to cross-dress and my risky sexual transgressions, of which there were many, i.e. the torture would have forcibly stopped me. Because that's what conversion therapy has been proven to be. Torture. In the days after the op-ed was published, quote, the reality of how I portrayed myself set in, Shoup writes to me in an email. She believes, not without reason, that the whole world sees her as a pervert and a lunatic. Quote, I destroyed my life and the bridge back to being trans was burned. Shoup tried to update her advanced directives so that doctors would not be allowed to resuscitate or put her on life support in the process. She told her social worker, quote, I had been, you know, staring at the Valium bottle thinking about overdosing. Jesus. I had been staring at kitchen knives when I opened the drawer and thinking about stabbing myself. In late April 2019, Shoup was committed to a psychiatric ward. Like, literally, like I've always said, 41%, which is always weaponized by the right, which is the reported rate of attempted suicide, not successful ones, in the trans community, is not really like a statement of fact. It is a statement of intent, and they will often say they want to increase that number. They support, even if they pretend not to, and pretend to be, oh my god, trans people committing suicide is such a problem. Uh, they end up, studies have shown, pushing policies that end up increasing that number, and what decreases it dramatically is access to gender-affirming care, is positive social surroundings and environment. It's like they are literally creating additional percentages onto that, you know, weapon that they wield against trans people. Shoup was open about her mental health struggles at the time. In her emails to Curry, she mentioned needing help with her testimony because she was on a high dose of Valium. When Brooks asked her to work with a ghostwriter, she accepted, citing, quote, serious mental health issues that, quote, caused my writing to be a gift that comes and goes. Sullivan and Curry were both privy to the full account of her commitment. So, like, literally exhausting her use as a tool to the point where she can't even physically operate anymore. Literal demons. Like, and it's interesting, too, because literally they say the opposite is the case. TERFs literally say the opposite is the case. They say, oh, if our policies get put in place, the trans people or people who think they're trans, their mental health will get better. And here's one of their own who they coerced and manipulated into becoming a tool for them, having the literal exact understandable and predictable reaction to what their policies would actually do to everybody else. Yet when Sullivan engaged with Shoup's mental health, his approach was transactional. Shoup sent Sullivan a partial manuscript in which she disclosed that she had been sexually abused by a male relative. He wrote back that, quote, The background of mental illness is something many people need to understand. I think it would need to include even more background, such as some idea, though not in detail, of the abuse you suffered as a child. Holy fuck. And how that likely triggered your interest in cross-dressing. They will literally weaponize child sexual abuse for their political gain. Literal demons. Devils. In human skin. Jesus Christ. Curry is more sympathetic, at least on the surface, quote, So much of your journey seems to be a loss of control from people stealing it, hijacking it, co-opting it for their own nefarious purpose, selfishly and without regards for your well-being, she wrote. Yet the Family Policy Alliance continued to contact Shoup for testimony on anti-trans legislation. Yeah, some good cop, bad cop going on, I guess. Privately, Shoup spoke in terms of duty, quote, The parents of these kids also depend on me, she wrote to Sullivan. They're telling their kids, look, Jamie is telling you all this stuff is not only not real and harmful to your health, the media largely won't let these mothers speak, and they're more than willing to wield me like a sword, so I'm their voice. Yet, increasingly, all Shoup needed to be was alive, conscious, and willing to sign any transphobic statement that was put in front of her. The persona of James Shoup was more powerful and visible than ever, but the life and health of Eliza Ray Shoup increasingly did not matter. 
Shoop's lawsuit against the VA fizzled out in October 2019. Sullivan strongly preferred to file in Florida, thinking he would get a better verdict. Imagine my shock with Ron DeSantis land but was unable to find any local attorneys willing to help him prosecute the case. By that time, Shoup was on to her next project, helping Wolf and the Family Policy Alliance, the ADF, and more to draft a bill banning gender-affirming health care for minors, to be presented by South Dakota Representative Fred Douche. Also, his only medical experiences as a fucking chiropractor, actual pseudoscience. That is the person being called upon to testify to ban gender-affirming care. The work group's emails are public. Shoop said a lot of ugly stuff in them. She was particularly vehement on the topic of other, quote, gender-critical trans people. Unless they've taken formal steps to reclaim their birth sex and denounce gender ideology, please don't endorse or indulge these persons, she told the group. Allowing gender-critical trans adults to testify, she told Douche in a March 2020 email, quote, was literally like having people testifying, don't do this even though I'm doing it because it's life-saving. The self-awareness. During my phone call with Shoop last week, I quote that line back to her. She too was seeking HRT at the time. She knew that gender-affirming healthcare was life-saving because she had become suicidal when she lost access to it. It is the question I still can't wrap my head around. How could Shoop try to ban something for others if she knew that losing it would kill her? There's a long silence on the other end of the phone line. Quote, I don't have an excuse for that, Shoop says. Eventually, there is no excuse for that. There is no excuse, but maybe there are reasons. People with BPD are prone to, quote, splitting, seeing things as either pure good or pure evil. Shoop thinks that her disappointing early transition combined with her BPD caused her to believe that if transition wasn't an absolute good for her, then it was an absolute evil for everyone. She's working on that. She says, owning her experiences, not projecting. So, obviously, Shoop has a history of mental illness, of bipolar disorder, and that mental illness is being weaponized against her in order to manipulate her into literally acting against her best self-interest. What I've just described is literally part of the far-right radicalization pipeline and the Republican radicalization pipeline. Like whenever, for instance, a mass incident happens at a school or a grocery store, the Republicans will always be like, oh no, it's not people with, you know, histories of domestic violence, for instance. 60% of mass incidents involve a person who has a history of domestic violence. Those people having access to guns it's not that that's the issue you know it's a, it's a mental health because it's a lone wolf and they're just crazy and this is not a product of our policy positions or lack thereof on the issue and then they also go on to vote against increasing access for people to get mental health care and frankly regular health care it is a problem of their own design they understand that actual mentally well put together people don't often turn out to be republicans don't end up turning into conservatives because you have to be relatively put together to understand that black and brown people just living their lives isn't a threat to anybody. Queer and trans people just living their lives isn't a threat to anybody. Women being able to be fully fledged citizens and not the property of their husbands and fathers not hurting anybody. You have to specifically be led astray to believe that. It is not in human nature to believe this. So they have to try to restrict people from access to mental health care in order to continue having voters, right? This is why in any kind of like men rights circle, there will never be any actual advice on mental health past work out and clean your room. In fact, going to therapy is often seen in a lot of meninist circles as being a sign of weakness because the continued exploitation of these mentally ill people is useful for their political ends. You can make good choices. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to make good decisions for yourself when you are not fully mentally available, let's say, because of whatever it is you're struggling with. Yet, if Shoop's narrative in 2019 was that she was too mentally ill to transition, the narrative in 2023 can't be that she is too mentally ill to detransition. Both stories rob Shoop of her agency. Shoop made choices, and it seems to me that one of the things driving her was very simple. The anti-trans movement made Shoop feel important to someone, or many someones, being used made her feel necessary. During our phone call, she recalls the night the Daily Signal op-ed went live, quote, I sat there at my screen watching these high-powered Twitter accounts, a lot of them anonymous, but tens of thousands of followers tweeted one by one. It was an orchestrated event. Less than 24 hours later, Fox was on the phone going, hey, we want you on Laura Ingram tonight. We'll send a car to pick you up. They're so excited. That would be a big moment in anyone's life, and it was particularly huge for a middle-aged veteran living on disability. Shoop, for what it's worth, agrees with this. Quote, I'm just sitting at home, adrift, every day, she tells me. So, you know, what is it like when somebody like Marciano sends me a new mission to go on? I got something to do, I'm useful now. I'm no longer this loser on disability, I'm a useful person to a movement. And this is not unique to the TERF movement, this is not unique to the anti-trans movement, this is not unique to any bigoted movement seeking to oppress a marginalized identity. It's always the same. So much the same way, 
that the far right utilizes this kind of meritocracy mindset of, oh, you just got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, you know, it's the brown people, the illegals that are taking your jobs, and that's why you can't get a good paying job. It's so you look down at somebody else so you can't see up at the boot of the fucking capitalist that's on your neck. The capitalist that decided to hire and exploit a immigrant worker because they know they can threaten them with deportation and therefore give them less wages. Exploit them harder than they're already exploiting citizens of this country. It is always the same. The antidote to this is actually allowing for these people to get the mental health care and the medical health care that they need. Because once you have a fully actualized idea of yourself and your mental health is accounted for as much as you possibly can, you are less vulnerable to being exploited by the literal demons in human skin that are the ADF, that are wolf, that are the turf movement, that are conservatives, that are Republicans. You are less useful to them if you you are actually mentally put together. This is why they vote against expanding mental health care access all the time. And then simultaneously decry all of their opposition as mentally ill and deranged. There is a long history of extremist movements recruiting damaged and isolated individuals to do their dirty work. Yet, Shoop's crusade wrecked her life, and in the end, the movement that elevated her also chewed her up and spat her out without hesitation. Many such cases. There was no big fuck you, I'm out moment for Shoop. No definitive point when she knew it was over. The tide just turned on her. A fellow turf named Karen Davis started publicly attacking Shoop for her supposed autogynephilia. Shoop says she received death threats. Really? From the side of the fence that always pretends that they're getting this deluge of death threats from the trans rights activists, turns out that the trans rights activists, i.e. trans people not wanting to be oppressed anymore and having to turn into activists out of self-defense and self-preservation, are actually getting death threats all the fucking time. Literally all the time. Often credible ones, too. If they were actually getting these death threats, they'd be posting proof of them everywhere? Yeah. I don't post mine that often, uh, or often at all. Like, if I look into the harassment that I get, I'm usually making fun of it. Like, there's no reason for me to be open about anything else other than shit I can ridicule, because then it just looks like a sign of weakness, and it just feeds into them. It's like a positive reinforcement, right? So you have to ridicule it. You can't, like, play it up for sympathy as much as it might be helpful to do that. Uh, obviously, the caveat to that would be, like, if your life is in imminent danger and you can receive, like, mutual aid help from people from doing that, then yeah, obviously. If it doesn't seem credible and you're just like a person on the internet getting this shit, just be careful, I guess. But I mean, do what you will. That's just me. I don't know. Quote, I was gradually waking up to the fact that, you know, I was just a useful idiot, are the two words I would use, Shoop tells me. I got the vibe that they wanted me to help them, they wanted me to use them, and they wouldn't trust anybody like me around their kids. She does not expect things to get easier now that she's leaked the emails. Quote, I burn bridges on both sides of the aisle, so at this point I'm just all alone in my life, she says. The person she's paying attention to now is an 18-year-old named Chloe Cole. Oh. I did not get this far in the article when I first read it off stream. Hmm. How does Chloe Cole just happen to be one of the few detransitioners that the right repeatedly has on all of their anti-trans power hours in the media? Hmm. Makes you wonder. Cole, who recently filmed an interview with Jordan Peterson and has been thanked by name in Ron DeSantis' Florida State of the Address, is another, quote, detransitioner, and as Shoop has exited the scene, Cole's star has been steadily on the rise. Shoop worries that Cole is being manipulated. She thinks Cole's mental health might be worse than she lets on, and that's not an impossibility. She is literally 18 years old, right? For as much as the right talks about, oh my god, the trans is, they're trying to groom the kids into being trans, and turns out, that might be some projection as well. Imagine my shock. Quote, she's like I was. She's a younger clone of me, Eliza Ray Sheep says. My worry is what's going to happen to her when all the attention is withdrawn. Tools are not infinite, chat. Tools are not infinite. Tools do not last forever. You gotta replace a hammer every now and again after you've been using it for so long. You gotta upgrade your CPU every now and again when a better version comes out and the games get harder to play with the old one you had. Eventually, a tool will exhaust its use and it will be replaced and or destroyed. And political tools are no different. This is why the right likes their tokens as much as they do. It's a good article. I was not expecting to read literally the entirety of Homer's Iliad on stream today, uh, but I think it was worth the while. But yeah, uh, stay safe out there, I suppose. This has been a long enough video. Wait, is there anything I can add on? Aha, we can end on a lighter note. We can end on a lighter note, chat. Chat, chat. I love ending on a lighter note. We've got Governor Tim Walls, Big Dick Walls, like the Giga Chad of the Midwest, Minnesota Governor, 
just made Minnesota a trans refugee state with an executive order. So this was um, March 8th. He will decline extradition requests. He will refuse subpoenas. No resource can be used to enforce bans. They will be the first state to upgrade to dark blue safest states on Aaron Reed's uh, trans risk map. Good resource, depending on where you're at. So you got Governor Tim Walz on Twitter. Today, I took executive action to protect access to gender-affirming health care in Minnesota. My message is clear. Here in Minnesota, our LGBTQ plus neighbors will not be denied or punished for seeking life-affirming and life-saving medical care. Also, Tim Walls has recently codified into law access to free school lunches to kids. So for as much as the right-wingers are whataboutin' the children, Governor Tim Walls, at least on that issue, seems to actually be about it and is willing to feed hungry kids. And because of that, a whole bunch of right-wingers are up in arms about, oh my god, but if you give kids a free lunch, then they'll become dependent on the state and they'll be in a perpetual childhood. This is also the side of the fence that was praising uh, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders for loosening child labor laws, by the way. So here is uh, Governor Tim Walls on CNN this morning talking that shit. And what we want to say is we're there to protect children. We're there to have you understand that in Minnesota you're going to be protected. And I just want to be clear. I will never understand what goes into the thinking of these folks to bully these children. It is not impacting them in one bit and making it um, a living hell for children, for families, for adults, for folks who are just trying to bring themselves in. Uh, so in Minnesota, we're making it very clear we're not going to cooperate with these folks. We're not going to extradite people. We're going to say that this is a place where you can come to make these decisions. I am, um, this is, um, these, the community, the trans community is, is as terrified as they've ever been. I know We've seen right. attacks across the nation, even here in Minnesota, and, and we're, we're now saying we have to be much more proactive. We proactive, have to be much brother. more aggressive proactive. about making sure that folks are protected. So um, this is another of the fronts that, again, you know, don't deal with climate change. Um, don't deal with other things. Deal with making people's lives miserable on something that won't impact you. That's what these governors are doing, these attorney True. generals are doing. And, and I've had it I, as a teacher. I will not stand bullies. I never did. And I'm not going to stand bullies who are masquerading as somehow about freedom. This has nothing to do with personal freedoms. It has everything to do with forcing an ideology on a vulnerable group of people for short-term political gain. It will, won't stand. And in the long runs, Americans are far better than that. And, and they're going to find that out. Hell yeah. That's really good rhetoric as well. This is, like, at least on this specific topic, this rhetoric is very good. It goes on the offensive about actually being for the protection of children, which studies have literally shown that it is. It also uses, like, similar rhetoric that I've been using, like, has he been watching my stream? What's going on? About how the overemphasis on trans people, the almost pathological obsession on trans people that Republicans have, was part of what could have caused their big red wave in the midterms to turn into a red piss puddle in a public toilet. And it's really good. And I think this is like winning messaging as well. Like, specifically, like, don't deal with climate change, don't deal with other things, like, you could refine that better to talk about any specific thing that's happening in your specific state or district. Like, for instance, if your state has a big problem with the minimum wage, for instance, don't raise the minimum wage, focus on making trans people's lives worse for no reason, it's not affecting you in any way at all, blah, 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 blah. That's a really good way to not only utilize the fact that it seemed to hurt the Republicans in the midterms, the overemphasis on trans people, as well as, like, put forward the idea that you're actually for increasing the minimum wage in that instance. Very nice. Big fan. I think we'll end it there.